our best to get that clip off. It's, it's Will, Del Curl, and the Sun. There you go. Okay, good. Well, it's a good thing. Yeah. Just, just don't, we, don't, we just shouldn't live for it. So you can write a check to Wave Starters. Just All one word, word, right? It's one yeah. One word. W A V E S T A R T E R S. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Spelling me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. And, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Wave Starters is an organization you want to support. How's that for a sentence? Good sentence. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me read some scripture, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to invite Andrew to come up. And the scripture I just want to remind us of is something that Andrew shared with us last night, a, a key verse for him, and, and a wonderful verse, a, a wonderful verse from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, as Andrew mentioned last night, likely um, almost the last word that you get from the Apostle Paul before he was um, martyred. Uh, he's... He's in prison, and it's very dark, but he says this, 418, 2 Timothy, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's a great verse. Let's pray. Lord God, it is our desire, and we, when we ask you to increase our desire, that this is what is going to happen here today. This is what's going to happen in the life of our church. And this is what's going to happen in each of our lives. That we're going to have great confidence in you to bring us home safely 
into your kingdom, and that is our destiny. But Lord, also, and especially, that as that is happening, and as whatever else is happening, that Lord, you will receive glory now and forever. So Lord, it is our desire that more than anything else today, you would be honored and glorified by our speaker, but also by all of the hearers, Lord, that we will listen well, and that we will think well, and that we will respond well, all to your glory. Thank you for today. Thank you for this special day. We commit ourselves to you and ask for your presence to guide and direct and woo us to yourself. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Andrew Brunson. Well, I'm really encouraged that some of you are here and didn't get scared off after last night. So, that's good. I'll do my best this morning. So this morning, I'm, I'm going to talk less about my experience. And uh, then this after, in the second session today, <clears throat> I'll go back into sharing more from, from the prison experience and some of the things I learned there that, um, that I think may be helpful to some of you. But, but today I want to make more the, explain more uh, the dark wave that I think is coming, this uh, dark wave of hostility and persecution that I think is going to break on the church in the United States. <clears throat> I think one of the reasons for my imprisonment was so that I could, I, you heard yesterday how, you know, if I repeat myself, please uh, just ignore it. Uh, <laughs> Because I forget what I say where, and I talked to a lot of people yesterday, and I, I may repeat things. Um, but one of the reasons I think God allowed me to break so thoroughly and so deeply and multiple times in prison was because in my weakness and um, you know brokenness, I had to learn to strengthen myself so that I could I could be faithful. And. Uh, <clears throat> I, want, I, I am sharing some of those things with you. Yesterday, the danger of the offended heart. This afternoon, I'm going to talk about the aspect of fear and also uh, building, building courage. Uh, and really, it's about perspective. Uh, how to build the right perspective as we go into more difficult times. I, I think that's a, a very key thing. And, and I look forward to sharing that with you this afternoon. Right now, I want to sort of lay the, set the context for what I think we're going into. And... Uh, you know, when Noreen and I went to Turkey in 1993, when we left the States, uh, it, it was a different country in many ways. And it, it was kind of shocking to come back and see how drastically it had changed. When I came, when we went there, I think, uh, to be a Christian, Christianity was viewed positively. Uh, Christian morality was normative. Not everyone lived up to the standards of Christianity, but it was the standard about, against which other things were evaluated. As they see, he's not living up to those standards. He's a hypocrite or whatever. But my point is, our society generally looked at those standards, uh, and they were accepted. And at this point, uh, there's been such a marked shift that to be a Christian is... No longer socially advantageous. In fact, if you if you go, it's it's the opposite. It's a disadvantage, especially if you go into high status professions, uh, uh, more elite professions. Certainly, uh, I would say Christian morality, moral standards, have been repudiated by our by our culture, and they are seen as actually being harmful. So if you, if you push what the Bible teaches uh, on, on a number of areas that are contested in our culture, then, then they're actually seen as, as doing harm to people. And Christianity is seen as kind of undermining the social good. I remember in, uh, it wasn't that long ago that you know, Obama, when he was running for president, really had to burnish his credentials as a good Christian you know, in, uh, uh, in Chicago. I don't know if you remember that. It was, very, it was still seen as, as desirable to tell everyone that he, he was actually a Christian and had been to, attending a church for a long time. I think, I think we're, we've moved past that. And it's, it's no longer... Someone had written about this as we were in a positive world, and we came into a neutral world, and now we're in a negative world as far as Christians are concerned. And I think it's, 
we're, we're in that negative phase, but we're going to go beyond that uh, to a more hostile phase. So people who are hostile to, I call faithful followers of Jesus. There are all kinds of people who say they're Christians in this country. Many of them are cultural Christians. Uh, some are in churches that don't really uh, see the Bible as, as the authority according to which we should live our lives. But for those who are faithful followers of Jesus, who try to be um, uh, live up to the standards of Scripture, I think that people who uh, the the people who run most of the institutions in our country, in our society, are increasingly well. They're post-Christian and they're increasingly hostile to people who are faithful followers of Jesus. So if you look into uh, think of the different institutions. In our, in our society. Uh, the news media, the entertainment industry, Hollywood, and all the enter entertainment industry, uh, the arts, social media, uh, professional sports, uh, law, at least the people who run these organizations, uh, law, medicine, uh, public health, Wall Street, big tech, uh, corporate boardrooms, most NGOs, uh, the whole uh, educational system from kindergarten up through the universities, uh, the administrative state, so the great majority of government workers, and in the last years, increasingly, not, not the enlisted and lower officers, but higher officers, the, the leadership of the military also. Uh, they have, uh, these institutions are, are led by people who are increasingly hostile to people of faith. I shouldn't say people of faith. They're, increased, they're not going to be hostile to Muslims or to Hindus. <laughs> they're hostile to faithful followers of Jesus. And uh, the elites who lead these institutions are, I don't know that they're all working in unity, but they all have the, a, a, a similar agenda, I think, to impose a progressive agenda on society. Now, they don't have to be in the majority. They don't have to be the majority of the country. I don't think they are, but they have the largest platforms. They have the loudest voices. They control access to the high-status professions, uh, to the credentialing bodies, uh, and they control the narrative-shaping institutions. They shape the narrative, and then a lot of people who don't necessarily uh, buy into everything they say, they're very affected by this and end up sliding into that stream and that way of thinking. So uh, the, the elite in these areas, they... Uh, they have tremendous amount of wealth, and they also own, and this is important, the levers of enforcement. So they control the commanding heights of our society. And there's, there's no way to remove them or vote them out because they weren't elected to these positions. They just kind of taken over the institutions in our country. And so that's why I say there's not a, uh, a political salvation. Some people are thinking, well, if we have this conservative uh, person who gets into office, and they're going to change everything. I've seen in some, in a number of places. I think there is a, a, a trust in Trump. You could say, if Trump gets in, everything will be okay. And I think, no, it won't be. It doesn't. Right now, it doesn't matter if your favorite evangelical uh, or pastor got in to become the leader of the country, because the political is only one slice, one institution. It's very powerful when it affects many things, but. You can have someone who, we need men and women of courage who will, in the political area, will carve out areas of freedom for believers. We need people who will do that. Uh, it's, it's very important. But, but they're not going to be able to change the direction of our culture. Our culture is so far gone right now, and I will go into that more. So there's, we should not look to political leaders to save us. They can help in some areas, but the direction that we're going is, there's a strong current heading in that direction. And so this isn't something we're going to vote our way out of. Uh, it's, it's a darkness that we're going to have to face. Anyway, what we, as I said, even if you get wonderful politicians, the direction of our culture and all of our institutions are already increasingly anti-Christian. So I think there are two main wedge issues that are going to drive this hostility and persecution. The first is, uh, there, are, there are a number of wedge issues. I think these, these are the two most important ones. The first is the exclusivity of Jesus and salvation. 
So if you say that Jesus is the only way to, to God, people are going to react to this. If a church teaches this, you're basically saying to everyone else, you know what? You're wrong. <laughs> people don't like to hear that. You can say it in a very loving way, but people don't like to hear that. Especially because it's not inclusive. It is actually, it, it's, it's saying this is the only way. And people will react to that. And the second is uh, that Jesus, Jesus expects, he demands obedience from, from his followers in a number of areas that are very contested in our culture. So I mentioned yesterday issues of life. By the way, I think the issue of life, uh, pro-life, uh, any attention that it receives, it, it should receive that. I was just pointing out, for those who were here last night, uh, who were not here, that, that there are other issues that are very dominant in our churches that are, that are huge issues to God that we're not really addressing because, because our culture has so affected the church that these uh, ways of thinking and ways of acting have filtered into the church. And if we brought some of these things up, especially in the area of sexual morality that our country is dealing with, then it would actually divide the church if we, if we teach Christian standards or biblical standards. But there are other areas, uh, biblical justice, which is different from social justice, uh, issues of family, issues of marriage, uh, and especially sexual morality and, at this point, gender identity. And so uh, all of these issues are, very, are being fought over in our country. And if you hold a biblical standard, if you say what God says about these issues, well, biblical standards are increasingly seen as hate speech. Now, uh, I think that it's, it's the LGBT... Uh, and sexual morality issue that is especially going to, to be a wedge issue and is going to lead to opposition to Christians. Now, if uh, some, some leaders, you know, when uh, they don't want to talk about these issues, I don't know what your church does, so uh, this is not addressed to you, but this is something that's spreading in many even conservative churches. Uh, they don't want to talk about these issues. And one, one thing is, some say, well, you know, we don't want to, don't be political, you know. Don't talk about this, this is political. Well, if you say what God says about something, that's not being political. I don't want to be political. You know, I, that, that's not my agenda at all. But I, if I say what God says about something, I'm not being political, I'm just being faithful to Scripture. Know? And so th there's something interesting in, in uh, Judges uh, when uh, Israel crosses into the promised land and then uh, Joshua has an encounter with, with this uh, uh, supernatural being. And uh, he says, who are you? Are you on our side or on the side of our enemies? And this, uh, uh, he says, neither. I'm, you know, the captain of the Lord's army, basically, something like that. I don't remember the exact phrase. So it's interesting. He doesn't say, no, I'm on your side, Joshua. He says, I represent God's side. He doesn't say I'm on your side. And I think the point here is that we need to get on God's side. You know, God doesn't have a, he's not Republican, he's not Democrat, he's not independent, he's, he's God. And, and he says, I have side. And there are many issues on which God has a very clear directive. And it's incumbent on us to get on his side. And so this is why I say one of the main things that we need to practice in, in well, in many areas, but is, uh, is to say what God says. I had to do that in prison where uh, I'm questioning his faithfulness and love and eventually I have to say, no, I'm going to declare what's true even if I don't understand it. But it's also in other areas that we need to, if God says something is sin, we need to say it's sin. If God says something is good, we need to say that it's good. It doesn't mean we have to go out into our workplace and say, hey everyone, I want you to listen to me. God says that all of these things you're doing are sin. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about living consistently if we are asked uh, and, and certainly holding those standards in our own behavior and lives. That, and we need to basically line up with God. If we're doing that, then that's not being political. But you will be accused of being political. The second, one of the other things that I've heard from leaders is, you know, and I've been surprised by some of the people who say this, but 
They say, you know, if we talk about these things, we're going to be thought of as unloving. They're going to say we're extremists, that I'm extremist and my church is extremist. And we don't want to be misunderstood. And I think, but of course you're going to be misunderstood. You should expect that. You know, Jesus was the most loving man in all of history. The, you know, compassionate, loving, generous, all the good things you want to say. He was, you know, <laughs> um, the essence of these things. And yet, he was called evil and demonic. And then an enraged mob ended up killing him. So Jesus uh, didn't say, the world is going to love your message. The world is going to see your righteousness and they're going to want to be just like you. He didn't say that. He said, actually, the world hated me and the world is going to hate you. And so we should, we should expect it. Now, we haven't in our society... In our, because, uh, you know, there are many faithful people in our history as a country and followers of God. And so we were in a, in, a, in a very different environment than the one we're going into. But that is what we'll face. I think of, for myself, if they had uh, said, oh, you know, Andrew Brunson is, is evil because he's in our country planting churches and telling people about Jesus. I still would have felt terrible in prison and all that, but I would have... Has, would be a badge of honor. Yes, that's right. I'm suffering because of Jesus. Okay? No, but they didn't give me that honor. They said, well, he's a spy. He's a terrorist. You know? And uh, he wants to overthrow the government on all these different things. He wants to cut the heads off of Turks. They put this kind of stuff in the media. He threatened to cut the heads, decapitate Turks. You know, and it's just, well, it's not true. They're not going to honor us by really saying what we are, you know, that they hate us because we stand with Jesus, you know, that they hate us because we, you know, are righteous. They won't say that, just like they didn't about Jesus. They will, they will say that you're evil. And so we need to prepare our hearts to be misunderstood. This is, and it's difficult. It's difficult to be misunderstood. Some of the things that I most remember are the times that I was misunderstood about little things, and I still cringe at them. <laughs> and, but that we have to prepare our hearts for this. And so this is what I think it's going to look like if we, if we stand on the side of God. I think people will say, your views are hateful. Uh, you make me feel uncomfortable. I don't feel safe around you. You're, you're, you make people around you not feel safe. And hate has no rights. And so you must be silenced. You must be marginalized. You must be punished. Um, there's a... Uh, a tech guy named Mark Andreessen, I don't know if some of you have heard of him, said, I predict, this is what he said, I predict essentially uh, identical censorship deplatforming policies across all layers of the internet stack. You know, and he goes through client side, server side, ISPs, cloud platforms, content delivery network, payment networks, operating systems, browsers, email clients, with only rare exceptions. The pressure is intense. This is what he said. There's going to be this kind of censorship that spreads across all of these platforms. And so uh, we will be deplatformed. People will say, you can't work here. You can't work in, in this business any longer because of your hateful views. You can't study at this school. You can't use our bank. You can't use our credit cards. You can't use our financial services like PayPal to make payments or receive payments. Uh, I've, I've, Noreen and I have uh, been spending time with uh, people from the uh, Chinese church, you know, the, the illegal underground Chinese church. And uh, one leader told me that what they're especially looking at in China, the leaders right now, Christian leaders, is how to deal with, with banking. This is a very serious problem for them. Uh, I have a... We have a friend named Sam Brownback. He was the uh, he was a senator from Kansas, and then a governor of Kansas, and then he was appointed ambassador uh, for international and religious freedom in the Trump administration. And he set up a, a, basically a, an NGO dealing with religious freedom uh, the last few years, and their the, the accounts were frozen by Chase, which is the largest bank in the U.S. And you think, well, if they can freeze Sam Brownback's account, who was a senator and a governor and an ambassador, they can do it to you. <laughs> they can do it to me. And in fact, they did do it to me. 
When I came back from Turkey, my accounts were frozen. Actually, not frozen. They said, we're shutting you down. You can't use our credit cards. You can't have an account at this bank. Mary says, well, what about me? She said, no, you're married to Andrew. You can't do anything either. And then they did it to my oldest son. He, and he was with a, a, a different bank, Bank of America. And, uh, and uh, I thought, why are they doing this to my son? And then I realized I had signed uh, with onto his bank account because he was 17 when he opened it. They needed someone who was older. So my name was there. So Chase and Bank of America uh, both canceled me. Now, we had friends at that time in the U.S. government, and uh, someone in the uh, Treasury Department communicated with those two banks. And both banks then said, oh, this was an inadvertent mistake. <laughs> How did both banks make the same mistake? With me, only me. And so my point is, I don't have friends who can help me now, but my point is, people are doing this. And uh, <clears throat> think how difficult it would be to function in a modern society where you don't have access to a bank account. And especially as our society becomes more dependent on digital technology to buy and sell, it, it will be even more so. <coughs> What if your licensing is removed so you can't practice your profession? I've talked with medical doctors you know, who are concerned if we don't celebrate what the culture wants us to celebrate, then we could, we could lose our licenses. And there are a number of Christians in this area who are concerned about it. Uh, anything that requires professional accreditation uh, or that has a, a regulatory body or certifications or professional associations, I think all of these will be at risk in the future. So there's going to be social and financial pressure. And maybe it's going to go beyond this for some people. And all of these things that I mentioned have already happened to some believers, and they've already happened to some ministries. So once we reach a tipping point, we, we haven't reached a tipping point yet, but once we reach it, it can be applied very quickly to many people. So. Trying to think whether I should tell you now about some of the stuff in China or later. What do you think? Okay, Norina says I'm not helping you. <laughs> okay, she says tell you later. Okay. So are things gonna get better? You know, let's let's look at what the future has for us. So these things I mentioned, they're not, they're not some possible future thing. It's actually what's happening now. This is the context we have now of, of hostility. And let's see, is it going to get better? So if we look at the millennial generation, you know, those are the people born between 81 and 96. I have a millennial son. Uh, a soci sociology of religion person at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, uh, along with fellow researchers, took a close look at the religious beliefs held by American teenagers. And they found that the faith held and described by most adolescents came down to something uh, that they called moralistic therapeutic deism. That can be a big phrase, but moralistic therapeutic deism. But I'll just don't worry about that terrible phrase. I'll just tell you what it means. So this is, this is what it looked like. God does exist. Uh, he, God wants people to, to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by other religions in the world. This is what God wants. He wants us to be good and nice. And the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Uh, God doesn't really need to be personally involved in your life except when you need to resolve a problem. And good people go to heaven when they die. Now, this is in some the creed to which most adolescent faith can be reduced. God wants me to be nice. He wants me to be happy. Uh, and if, I, if I'm good, I go to heaven. This was, study was done in 2005. So this was a millennial generation. This is what the majority of millennials believe. And not just all the millennials who are not in church. Many who are in the church believe this. Including in many conservative churches. What are, that when it comes down to it, they really think... God wants me to be happy. He wants me to be nice to other people. And if I'm good, I go to heaven. And this is the same for all of my friends. 
So this is the view held by most people who are under 40 years old. So what happens when a pastor, an evangelist, a teacher, a parent says to someone, hey, what you're doing is when they explain God's standards and maybe even confront a sinful behavior. What, if, what happens when you say, this is sin? God says this is sin. How are people likely to respond who have this point of view? You know, what you're saying makes me unhappy. Uh, you're saying my friend's lifestyle is wrong, but he's just being authentic to who he is. And he's a good person. He's a nice person. It's wrong to say something that would interfere in someone else's happiness. How can you tell me that this is wrong? And people who have this mentality, how can this level of faith survive the dark wave, the pressure that's coming? That's the millennials. And this is moralistic therapeutic deism has spread throughout the church in the U.S. Uh, even though most people don't know the name for it. But that is at base what they believe. So we look at Gen Z. I have two Gen Z children. 97 to 2013. So today among those who are under 30 years of age, just over 20% of them identify as LGBT. Think about that. Just over 20%. Now, what's interesting is that many of them are not LGBT in behavior, but they have so adopted this ideology that, that they identify in this way. So I'm just saying this, the LGBT ideology is deeply, deeply embedded now in the younger generation. If you look at the, uh, Noreen told me not to give you statistics, but I'm just gonna mention a couple. If you look at the country's top 160 universities, uh, a quarter of students identify as LGBT. And this is important because these are the universities that produce uh, the nation's future leaders. Okay. One fifth of all undergraduates, and these are the person, people who generally tend to rise into, the, uh, into leadership. Um, it's interesting that homeschooled and parochial schooled undergraduates are just as likely to identify as LGBT. That's, that was really interesting to me. The same as those from public or private school backgrounds. So this is spreading. You, you know, un unless you take smartphone away from your kids, you know, they, they're bombarded with this all the time. So 41% of Gen Z supports censorship of hate speech. 66% support shouting down speakers they consider offensive. 23% support using violence to silence such speakers. Who do you think they're going to want to silence? Against whom do you think they will feel justified in using violence? Against you. If you say what God says. Against faithful followers of Jesus. So this is, this is what the future looks like. Then we look at the area of religious freedom. All of this, these attitudes, these these this way of thinking, worldview, is going to have an impact on religious freedom in this country. It, it, right now, it seems clear <coughs> that religious freedom is increasingly seen as an issue of the political right. Uh, this is very bad for the future religious freedom because it wasn't like this in the past. Uh, you know, uh, but as, as this goes on, you know, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was passed I don't know, back in the 90s. It could not pass uh, now. It would be impossible. And in many states, I can't pass it, even in conservative states. So, so increasingly, the left is seeing this is an issue that the right uses uh, to cudgel other people with their bigotry. And so that means that increasingly, the left is not uh, going to uh, defend religious freedom. It's seen as something conservatives use to, to support their bigotry. Our elite law schools are functionally atheistic. Um, the problem with this is that this is where most of our future judges are trained. How well do you think the legal system will defend religious freedom in the future? Uh, uh, many people have kind of looked to the Supreme Court. Hey, the Supreme Court will defend us, and that's really where we put all of our eggs in our basket is. If we get good justices, we're okay. Well, what you have coming is a pipeline where most of the people in elite law schools are atheists 
or functionally atheists. They don't know evangelicals and they, they think that we're very weird and strange <laughs> with our beliefs. They don't understand them. So this is what Supreme Court Justice Alito says about the future religious freedom in the U.S. He says, in an increasingly secular society, he said, it is hard to convince people that religious liberty is worth defending if they don't think that religion is a good thing that deserves protection. So I don't think we will be able to de depend on the courts in the future to really defend religious freedom uh, the way that they have in the past. What about the church? How is the church doing? So as we talked last night, God is always working. There, he's always active. There are always pockets of revival. <laughs> There are always people coming to faith, being saved out of terrible backgrounds. And so the kingdom is always advancing. But we also need to acknowledge what, what's actually happening. You know, we always hear anecdotally, well, this church is growing. Well, there were a bunch of baptisms over here. Someone had a concert in the park and all these druggies got saved. And those are wonderful things. Uh, but if we look at the numbers across the country, then... We are seeing a great exodus from the church. I say there will be a great exodus in the future, but there's actually a great exodus in this generation already. Uh, there are millions, there are actually tens of millions of people who in the past uh, said that they were, had faith, who now say they have no faith. And there are millions and millions of people, uh, once you go into the data, uh, who when they were children, uh, they attended church regularly, but now that they're adults, they, they say they have no faith. And if you, when, when they're questioned, why, why, did, why have you left? Often they underline the teaching of the church in the area of family, marriage, and sexual morality. So there are millions and millions of people who have left the church in this generation. And it's not only weak believers from liberal churches who don't teach the Bible. <laughs> Many come out of evangelical churches and I, you, you probably know some. I, we know people who are very close to us. Uh, many, of, many of our friends have children who grew up as believers who have, who have left. And so the exodus is already happening, but it is going to get worse as pressure increases. So now if we look at the wider context, has this been enough already? <laughs> uh, but if you'll notice, I, I'm, not, I'm not looking depressed or discouraged or anything. You know, I, I, I will get to that in just a minute. Um, <coughs> I don't mean to the depressing part. I mean, why I'm not depressed and discouraged. I think I, 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 I see very clearly some things that are coming, but, but I also nurture a different perspective. And that's when I, I say we will go on to that. How should we approach these things? How should we view them so that we're not weighed down by fear and by, you know, dread, uh, because that's not what God wants, you know. So I want to paint now a picture of the wider context uh, of things that are coming. So just briefly, when we went through COVID, whatever your views are on different masking and shutting things down, whatever, what we saw is that there was a much more intrusive government in Western democracies. Uh, so things were done that we had never expected would be done. And so the level of control of mass surveillance, I remember uh, in, in Europe, we had to use QR codes uh, showing our vaccination so that we could go into the pharmacy even, uh, or to go into a grocery store, to get on any transportation. And uh, you know what happened in the United States, just the level of control and intrusiveness, and uh, you know the closing down, especially of houses of worship, uh, while bars were left open, while other things were left open. It showed the, how little the church is valued and that they were willing to, to do this. So there was an unprecedented biosecurity state in response to COVID and media censorship. And so uh, the normalization of mass surveillance. So in the, in the future, I'm not saying, we're already primed for, for something like this to happen again if people want to impose it. And so... Um, that's one thing, that those systems of control can be used again in the future. A, a second factor is the weaponization of the Western financial system against Russia. Now, I'm not saying in any way I support Russia. Putin has done an evil thing in invading Ukraine. I want to focus on a different aspect of it, which is basically that 
uh, the United States, along with Western Europe, basically cut Russia off from all financial transactions using what's called the SWIFT system. And SWIFT is basically the, the, the technological infrastructure, I'm sure I'm using the wrong words for these things, but that enables the transfer of money um, around the world. And so uh, the Russians were cut off from this because this is controlled by Western Europe and the US. And so, uh, and then a number of Western uh, uh, companies uh, stopped doing business with Russians. So you have Russians who are in Indonesia on vacation and suddenly their credit cards don't work because you know, now they have been closed down. And actually uh, MasterCard Visa didn't have to impose these kinds of uh, uh, bans on Russians. Uh, there was no government requirement for that, uh, but they did it uh, because the Russians were seen as evil. Right? And so, which you may think they are, and maybe they are. But they did this because they're evil and hateful. And so, what was applied to the Russians, who are suddenly a hated people, can very easily be applied to the next hated people, who are the followers of, faithful followers of Jesus. Now, uh, as an aside, this, this weaponization of the financial system uh, is probably going to lead to an alternative financial system. There are a number of countries now around the world. I know this may be boring to some of you, but I just see how it's going to affect us in the future. There, there are a number of countries, the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and they're joined by a host of other countries now who see that the U.S. used this against Russia to impose their will, to impose sanctions. And a num the, uh, most of the other large countries in the world saying, hmm, we need to make sure that the U.S. can't do this to us if they don't like something we're doing in the future. And so there is a very serious, concerted effort to set up an alternative financial system uh, that doesn't depend on the Western system. And uh, whatever you think about whether this was justified or not, this is going to be one of the results. And this, right now, countries involved with BRICS are have 43% of the world's oil and 40% of the world's GDP. So this is a major issue that we're going to confront in the future. It will lead to probably uh, de-dollarization in many countries, and this is going to bring a lot of financial difficulty to our country. But this is, this is one of the things that's coming. Uh, the same things that were imposed, restrictions that were imposed on the evil Russians can be imposed on the next evil group. Uh, many of you have heard of ESG. You know, the basically, uh, this is, uh, we can call it, woke well, capitalism or corporations. Uh, and there's something, I, I didn't realize this, but uh, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, those are, you know, but you can, many of you may have investments in those places. So the three of those combined, those that do index investing, the three of those combined uh, own on average 20% of every company and the S&P 500, okay? It's your money, but there are only actually a few people who manage that. Um, and this is what the leader of BlackRock, his name is Larry Fink, this is how he described the goals of their investment. Behaviors are going to have to change, Fink said. You have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock, we're forcing behaviors, okay? Most of this money in these three companies is in index funds, it's investments by millions of Americans, so it's not Larry Fink's money, but the decision makers, uh, this is what I, I read in different journals, there are around 12 people who really make the decisions for these three companies. And if you have 20% ownership in any major corporation, you have a lot of influence. And so you have a very small group of people with a very high degree of influence over any of the S&P 500 listed companies. And they're not friendly to Christians. None of these are believers.